hey students, if you need just a quick video to help you go through the first part of this chapter for your history class and you don't have enough time to watch the full video, that's what this is about. Um, I do encourage you to watch the full video because it does help supplement a lot of this information with additional material and of course questions that some people were asking that you may end up having questions about as well. Of course you can also post those questions um, in the comment section below, that's totally fine. So in this section we're going to talk about change over time and we're going to talk about human um, development as well. So for change over time that's what we tend to call evolution. And we know things change over time. There's stuff that exists now that didn't exist in the past. And there's stuff that existed in the past that doesn't exist now. So we know that there are changes uh, that happen for whatever reason. These are some other examples of extinct animals. And this is our good friend, the Velociraptor, which apparently had feathers, which is pretty interesting of a find. So evolution is going to be the name that we give this change. And that's all evolution means. Evolution is the name of this process. It is change over time. We're talking about it in this case, of course, like biology. We're talking DNA changing over time. But the word for evolution can also apply to any change over time. Um, that also includes ideas that evolve, which is actually where the word meme comes from. It's the evolution of an idea. Uh, we know DNA changes. You know DNA changes because I'm not a carbon copy of my parents and neither are you. So our DNA has changed over time. But what makes it change between me and my parents versus some other type of human that has fit into this different niche. So that's what we're going to be kind of going over real quick here. Evolution is something that still happens today. This would be one example of it. Mostly when we're talking about the peppered moth, we're talking about the peppered moth in this unpolluted environment. And you can kind of see this guy here and that's why we call them peppered moth because it looks like they're covered in a bunch of black pepper. This blends in very well um, on these backgrounds here. This background, the thing that these moths are hanging onto is uh, a tree that has moss on it or looks like maybe lichens or something on it. So they're hanging out here having a good time. This black moth is genetically possible. However, once this black moth shows up, comes out of that cocoon, it's pretty likely to be eaten. And you can see why, right? It, stands out against that background super well. That means if I'm a bird that eats these moths and I'm just flying by, at a quick glance at this side of the tree, I'm gonna see this black moth hanging out. And that's the one that I'm gonna eat. Could I see the other moth? Possibly, especially if I'm hanging out near the tree or in the tree as well. If I see the moth moving, sure. I'm gonna see it, snag it, have myself a tasty yeah. snack. But if I'm just flying by or doing something like that, the black moth is going to be the one that stands out to me. That means this moth is not going to have as many moth babies and as a result is not going to pass its DNA on very often. That doesn't mean that this DNA disappears out of the, the moth community, you can think about it as. That just means that when this DNA pops up again, they're going to die. Sorry, black moth. However, with the changes in the environment, in this case, um, coal pollution, so this is like coal factories that were set up nearby and they ended up making these trees pretty black. Now you can see that the one that sticks out is the peppered moth, the one that's still this black and white kind of splotchy. Um, our black moth is hanging out over here and then of course you can easily visibly just, hey, there is this peppered moth, he sticks out. That doesn't mean that the peppered DNA goes away. It just means it's less likely to show up in this region again. So that means now in places that don't have this pollution over here on the left, this type of moth is gonna be prevalent. In places over here, this type of moth is gonna be prevalent. I know some of you might be saying, yes, teacher, but there's still moths. And that's true. Evolution doesn't have anything to do with it must convert into some other species down the line or they can't be viably uh, producing offspring. It just means change over time in these groups because of environmental pressure that happens at the same time that there is a uh, genetic change that can be suited for that time period. Another example would be the skink. So this is not a snake and it's not a lizard. It's a thing called a skink. Uh, this type of skink in this region is losing its legs. Why? 
environmental pressure, plus at the same time, there were skinks that either had weaker legs, shorter legs, and so on, and they were able to move about this environment better. If I can more, if I can move around my environment better, I'm able to catch food, I'm able to be ro more robust, my immune system is better, I'm able to find a mate much better. That means these little legs I got, slowly over time, are going to be more commonly found in the population. Maybe they're never going to go away and this is what we're going to be left with. Maybe they will completely go away over time and we're gonna have this thing that looks kind of like a snake, but remember it's a legless skink. Whatever happens, the ones that have the shorter, weaker, nubbier little legs are the ones that are going to do better in this environment. Some environments that might be better suited for no legs would be things like water or certain types of hot, sandy desert environments. Um, you can look up the sidewinder snake and how it moves to show how quickly you can move without legs in a sandy region. This is the lipstick fish. Isn't the most pretty fish, but the lipstick fish um, is one of those interesting examples of something you probably have heard about where life starts in the ocean and then over time grows legs and walks out. How does that happen? Just like this. And so this is uh, that situation happening again, where we see these fish that are walking along the bottom of the, um, uh, walking along the bottom of their watery environment, um, as opposed to swimming through it. So pretty cool stuff. This is uh, red hair and green eyes, which showed up in about, I think it was about 15,000 years ago. Um, in humans. So this didn't exist before. So if you are a redhead, then you know, you, you are a recent, uh, recent mutation in human history. Um, if you want to know why they're called redheads, or if you want to know more about this slide about human or signs of evolution in the human body, please check out the longer video. Um, another word that you want to learn is hominids. Hominids are going to be our other ancestors that we evolved from. These trees or these evolution trees, you're probably familiar with seeing. And so that brings us to modern humans. As far as we can tell, um, all of human evolution that led to Homo sapiens happened in Africa. That doesn't mean that every hominid stayed in Africa. It just means the evolution that brought us to Homo sapiens happened in Africa. Cool. So what we're gonna call Homo sapiens is modern humans, just cause that's a little easier to say than Homo sapiens. In large numbers, we left about 60 to 70,000 years ago. That doesn't mean that there isn't modern human remains that are older than that outside of Africa. It just means that we were leaving in these large groups that were able to sustain themselves outside. Also, <clears throat> one of the reasons um, that we did start leaving in those large groups was due to uh, this situation that happened environmentally. Again, you can check out the longer video for that. So this concept that human evolution happened inside of Africa and then humans left Africa is called the out of Africa theory. Um, a theory in science is not a guess. A theory in science is the highest that a hypothesis could hope to be. So basically we need a bunch of evidence to figure out something and then the theory explains the evidence. That's, that's all it is. Um, this is different from something like a law. Laws in science are usually math or equations. Um, a theory explains it. So the law of gravity would be like a gravitational equation. Um, so you can calculate gravitational pull. The theory of gravity explains why that gravitational pull exists. Okay. So that doesn't mean that we're guessing about gravity. Um, so please understand scientific theory is not the same as theory in everyday English. Everyday English theory is sort of an educated guess. In science, this is something that we could use to predict things in the future because it's so accurate. Um, germ theory would be another example of something that we all understand is a real thing. It's not a guess. Bacteria and viruses do exist. Um, part that is how they behave and why they do what they do. That's all part of germ theory. Okay. Uh, the oldest continuous culture that we have today is the Aboriginal Australian culture. Just a tidbit for you. So uh, other than Homo sapiens, um, we did have some other groups leave that left a big mark 
in our DNA, okay? Uh, one of these groups is called Denisovan or Denisovan, however you want to pronounce that is fine, but I believe it's Denisovan. Um, we know more about them from their genetic impact on us as opposed to their um, fossil findings. Of course, we found fossils of them, but we had no more about them from their genetics. One that you may have heard of is Neanderthal. Um, so Neanderthal is a very, very successful hominid group. They left Africa about 300,000 years ago and went into Northern Europe and had a super fantastic time. They were awesome. When I was in school, we learned that Neanderthal were just like these stupid cavemen. But in reality, it turns out Neanderthal are pretty uh, like sophisticated. Um, history doesn't change. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's just our understanding of history changes because we're able to find more things and learn more um, based on the different technology that we have. For example, we didn't know anything about genetics um, until we were able to understand the human genome. So any of those findings now, we could understand them better. Um, so Neanderthal made weapons, and these are spears, but not spears for throwing, which does become important later on. They also made art. Um, not just this hand art here, but some of these very delicate art. Uh, it's pretty cool. They lived in groups like we did, and they also had death rituals. Could they have believed in some kind of religion? Possibly. Um, we're not sure at this time. Um, you can see here they also made these um, beautiful bits of jewelry. Um, these are not, these are replicas, okay? We're not putting, we usually don't put um, real fossils on display, just FYI. Um, we did meet Neanderthal, and the old idea used to be that we were just better than them and outcompeted them, and then they just died. Uh, turns out that there's a lot of fossil evidence and genetic evidence to show that we actually interbred with Neanderthal. As a result, European people and Asian people have between 2 and 4% or up to 6% of Neanderthal DNA, and it gives us some of these genetic predispositions. That doesn't mean that if you don't have Neanderthal DNA, you cannot have these problems, or if you do have Neanderthal DNA, you must have these problems. It just means that you're more likely to have them. That's all that means. So what happened to Neanderthal? There were two big reasons that it seems that they died out. Number one was lots and lots of muscle. Great for the type of attacking that they did and the type of hunting they did. Uh, not great when you start running out of food. Uh, one thing that is not on this PowerPoint that I can show you guys is a map of the Ice Age. And in this Ice Age map, excuse me again, we can see here at the top, this white part is this huge glacier. Uh, remember, Neanderthal lived in this region in Europe. Okay, and also higher. And of course, as things are getting colder and colder, you want to move south. However, this is not only going to change uh, the type of landscape to, to hunt in just by moving south, but also that type of cold is going to change a lot of the foliage. Neanderthal used to hunt by basically sneaking up on their prey in these wooded areas where they had a lot of cover from bushes and then stabbing the animal and holding them in place until they died. And if you want to know how we know that they did that, um, again, that's in the video, okay, or the longer video. So now they're in these areas where they can't sneak up on their prey, surely they can just throw their spears, right? Well, not only do they have to have spears that are able to throw, but on top of that, it turns out from some of these really amazing skeletons we found, um, their inner ear bone is fundamentally different from ours. This means that they're not as agile. They're not as good with running and jumping, throwing and aiming. So these small changes, not the biggest deal, right? But when your life is depending on you aiming something correctly, um, this is what's gonna contribute to their demise. Another way to think about it isn't so much that Neanderthal died out, but rather that they were more absorbed into Homo sapien, um, immigration groups. So that's another way to think about it. Um, another reason that Neanderthal was not as suited for hunting was because they did not domesticate dogs. They may have, but as far as we know, they didn't. Um, they may have had other pets of other types, but dogs are definitely the big thing that are going to help us for hunting. Um, and that seems to be something Neanderthal did not have the benefit of. Anyway, if you have any questions, again, post them in the comments section below. But I hope this has been helpful, and that's all I have for you. See you next time.